Hi, fourth graders. It's Ms. Kaposi here. I hope everyone is staying happy, healthy, and safe. So what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be reading a book, and this book and the book I read tomorrow are going to set you up with the background knowledge you need to understand the events that are happening in the book Number the Stars by Lewis Lowry that your teachers are going to start reading to you. And the book that I'm going to be reading today is called The Butterfly by Patricia Polacco. And some of you have definitely read Patricia Polacco's work either in the past or this year. She is the author of Pink and Say. She also is the author of Mr. Lincoln's Way and Thank You, Mr. Fokker. Some of you may have used these in your literary essays. So we're going to start with The Butterfly by Patricia Polacco. And it starts out with, to my great aunt, Marcel Solilage and her daughter, my aunt, Monique Bousset Ga, two very courageous women I will love as long as I live. So thinking maybe these are characters in the book, we're going to find out, but it seems that they have some sort of relationship with Patricia Polacco. So that's something we will have to see. So this is The Butterfly by Patricia Polacco. It was unusually bright that night outside of Monique's small bedroom window in choice le roy just outside of Paris. The moon was so radiant it seemed almost festive. As Monique gazed up at it, she thought that the moon must not know that her village was occupied by Nazi troops. All of France was, for that matter. There was a terrible war raging in what to Monique seemed like most of the world. So even just from this part, first paragraph, they're giving us the setting, right? They're kind of like a little inkling of it, right? We know it's taking place in a town or a village or a city outside of Paris, and that's in France, and France is in Europe. They gave us some information that a war is happening, and it seems like the war is happening with over across the entire world. And they mention here Nazi troops. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with this term, a Nazi troop is a German soldier during the time of World War II and the Holocaust, when the Holocaust is the time period that Number of the Stars is taking place in. So even just from this paragraph, we can kind of see what the tone is of this time period. It seems to be very gloomy, very depressing. There's all this war happening around us. So if I were jotting a post-it note or jotting in my reader's notebook, I would definitely take note of the setting. That the author is giving us. But this night the moon seemed not to care. She pulled Winwaf, her cat, up next to her and hugged and kissed her good night, then drifted off to sleep. Monique, Monique didn't quite know why she woke up, but suddenly she saw a ghostly little figure sitting just next to her on the end of her bed. A girl about her own age. She was petting Winwaf. Who are you? Monique whispered. The ghost child wheeled and looked with sad eyes that seemed frightened, then spun and ran from the bedroom. We'll have to see what this is about. It seems as though a ghostly figure has come into play here with Monique. So we'll have to see how this is developed throughout the story. The next morning at breakfast, Monique could hardly wait to talk to her mother about the ghost, but her mother seemed almost angry. It wasn't like Marcel Solilage to be angry at anyone. It was only a dream, child. Do you hear? Only a dream. Now go to school. God knows how much longer you will have the privilege of going to school with the war, her mother's voice trailed off. Think about the impact on the kids when they know that there's a war going on, they still have to be expected to concentrate in school. Monique couldn't wait to get to school so that she could tell her best friend Denise about the ghost. Since Monique was an only child, Denise was like a sister to her. On their way home from school that afternoon, Denise asked Monique, what did this ghost look like? She was dark and had very sad eyes, Monique answered. Weren't you very, very frightened, Denise asked. At first, yes, but the longer I looked at her, a feeling came over me, a feeling of fear for her. Monique answered. They stopped and peered into the front window of Monsieur Marc's candy shop. He waved to them as he always did. 
He loved the children in the neighborhood and always had tiny bits of brightly wrapped candies for them in his apron pocket. As the girls entered the store, they saw that most of the jars that had been used to fill with every kind of candy and confection were empty. The war. But Monsieur Marx had saved something for them. For you, little Monique, Monsieur Marx cooed as he dropped a bright dot of sweetness into her hand. And one for you, ma petite, he said, as a beautifully wrapped confection rolled into Denise's waiting hands. Monique and Denise unwrapped their candies and popped them into their mouths. But as they were walking away from the store, they suddenly saw tall boots coming toward them up the hill. The tall shining boots of marching Nazi soldiers, their ears clicked like gunshots along the cobblestone path. People froze and tried not to look at the soldiers. The girls wanted to run, but they knew better. They had learned to chat and laugh as if no, they had no cares in the world. Are they looking at us? Monique asked breathlessly when they have gotten a distance away. Denise looked back. No, they're still marching. When then they heard loud yelling and glass breaking, they both wheeled and looked. To their horror, they saw Monsieur Marx being dragged from his shop by the Nazi soldiers. Schwein! Judenschwein! They heard the Nazis shout as they pushed Monsieur Marx to the ground. They watched the Nazis kick him hard in the ribs with those tall black boots. Monique covered her mouth to hold back a scream. Then a car drove up and the Nazis threw Monsieur Marx into the back of it. Don't look for too long, Monique, Denise warned. If they do, they'll come for us next. So why do we think Monsieur Marx was taken away by the Nazis, by these German soldiers? It didn't seem like, from what we know, he was harming them, he was saying anything bad. So this is something that we're going to have to figure out. Why was it seemed like an innocent man taken away and beaten up? The girls were both sobbing by the time they ran up to Rue de Bernard, to Monique's mother's house. They knew it had happened before during the years of occupation, but they had never seen it. And when they say occupation here, they're meaning of when the Nazi soldiers basically took over their country. And to Monsieur Marx, why, why, my mom, why did they do that to Monsieur Marx? Monique choked through sobs. The Nazis hate people like Monsieur Marx, ma chérie. It is so pointless and cruel, her voice faded to a whisper. What do you mean, people like Monsieur Marx, ma mom? Monique asked again. You know, Monique, her mother answered, Jews. But Monsieur Marx is a Frenchman, Denise said. Marcel hugged them both. The Nazis can't be here forever, my sweet children. Mother France has been here for centuries. They, for a short, terrible time. Marcel had tears in her eyes. Now I'll fix you some soothing tea. Monsieur Marx would not want either of you to worry or be sad. Madame, a voice called from the front door. It was Pere Bolliard, their priest from St. Germain de Pris. He rushed in. Have you heard what happened to Monsieur Marx? Marcel mentioned to him to come into the other room and they closed the door. Monique was used to her mother having hushed conversations in the living room especially since the war. So now we know a little bit more about the what seems to be the intention of these Nazi soldiers. Even just from this page, we know that the Nazi soldiers do not like people who are Jewish. They do not like the Jews. So they're taking them away, it seems like. And it seems like just for no reason, just because they're Jewish. I mean, sure Marx was a candy man, right? But there seems to be something a little more with the Nazis' hatred of the Jews. Many nights passed and Monique didn't see the little ghost again, but late one night Monique awoke with the with a start to see her little ghost sitting on the window seat. This time it was holding Minois. Monique thought, this is no dream. I can hear Minois purring. I see you there, Monique whispered. The little ghost sprang to her feet, but Monique's stopped her from running away this time. Don't be afraid, it's all right for you to be here. The little ghost with sad eyes sat down and said nothing. 
What is your name? Where do you come from? Monique asked. The girl just sat for the longest time, holding on tightly to Minois. I once had a cat just like this one, she finally said. Her name is Minois. What is yours? Monique sat down by her. My name is, my name is Severine. Severine, where do you live? Monique whispered. I have lived in many places since the war, the ghostly Severine answered. Where do you live now? Your parents must miss you, especially in the middle of the night like this. The girl didn't answer. Where do you live? Monique insisted. Here, Severine finally said. Here, Monique said with such a surprise and so loudly that it might have awakened the whole neighborhood. But I live here. Hmm, so now we know a little bit about this ghostly figure who is a girl. Severine, and she keeps insisting that she lives here. Well, here can mean a lot of things. It can mean in this house, it can mean in this town, it can mean in Paris, it can mean in France. There's all these different things that it can mean. And how could she be, if she was living in the house, how could she actually be living in the house? And how come Monique didn't know? Severine motioned Monique to follow her. They both tiptoed back down the stairs and crept into the day room. There, Monique saw the rug pulled back and what, look, what looked like a door in the floor. Severine pulled up the door and they both climbed down a narrow set of stairs into a part of the cellar that Monique didn't even know existed. The walls were scraped clean and there was a small table with a tiny tray and supper dishes on it. Monique could see another small room with cots. It looked like people were sleeping on them. My mother, father, and I have been here for a very long time, Severine whispered. We are being hunted by the Nazis, you know. We are Jews. There are many of us hiding all over France. But how have you stayed here without my mamma knowing? Oh, Madame Solilage? She knows. We aren't the only ones she has helped. How could this have been happening in her home and her mother never said a word about it? Your mother made me promise that I would never come to your room again while you were there. I don't understand. It puts you in great danger to know about me. She is protecting you. Monique started to say more, but it sounded like footsteps echoing upstairs. Could Marcel have heard them? Vite, vite, Monique. Severine pushed her out of the hidden room. But when will I see you again? Monique whispered as the door closed over the top of her new friend right so now we, again we know a little bit more about this character she is being her and her family are being hunted by the nazis because they're jewish and monique's mom marcel has been hiding them for a very long time and she had no idea about it and it says that marcel has been doing this for a while so there have been multiple families that have been hiding out in this house without monique even knowing The next morning at breakfast, Monique didn't know what to say to her mother. Somehow she seemed mysterious, but she chatted to Monique cheerfully as always. Go to the garden, my sweet child, and cut some of your beautiful flowers for our table, won't you? Monique skipped out of the kitchen doors into her garden with Minoif trotting after her. Minoif was playing with the petals of the flowers as Monique cut them and put them into the basket when all at once the cat crouched and made herself flat against the, round, against the ground. Her eyes were ablaze. The Monique saw, why? A papillon, a butterfly, fluttered from flower to flower. As it landed on a bright blue iris near the wall, Monique gathered Minois into her lap. No, ma petite, just look, see how beautiful. They both sat quietly as they watched the butterfly together. So here... We're first introduced to the butterfly, the title of the book. So we, we know for a fact that the butterfly is going to be very significant and very important. So if I were jotting a post-it note or jotting in my reader's notebook, I would definitely take note of the butterfly in this scene. Suddenly, the air grew still and heavy. The birds in the garden stopped singing. Minois hid herself in the fold of Monique's apron. Monique looked over the wall and saw tall, shiny boots. Her heart leapt into her chest. Three Nazi soldiers glared at her. One reached over the wall, took the butterfly in his leather 
covered fist. Jolie ne se passe. He grinned at Monique, then squeezed his fist. The other Taboot laughed. They mumbled something and walked away. So we also want to think about what could this butterfly represent, right? What, what, first of all, we know about butterflies, right? They can fly, they can go anywhere they like. That's something that we already know. And then think about what that can mean when the Nazi soldier is closing up the butterfly, right? Kind of squishing it. What can that mean? The butterfly can't fly when it's, when it's cooped up and squished up like that. Mamam, mamam, tall boots. Monique shrieked as she ran into the house and blurted out what had happened in the garden. Sacre bleu, those monsters. Her mother grumbled as she held her child as close as she could. Mamam, Monique finally sobbed. Did they do to Monsieur Marx like what they did to the butterfly? Her mother did not answer. She rocked Monique gently and stared out of the window. But Monique had her answer. Now she understood the sadness in Severine's eyes. The fear that was in her eyes of her neighbors and friends whenever the Nazi soldiers came close. She knew now she had to protect her friend. At all costs, she had to keep the secret that lived in her basement. So I would even note here on a post-it note in my notebook, something about the relationship between Severine and Monique. We know a little bit more about Severine and we know that Monique is saying that she will do anything to protect her because she needs her to be safe, her and her parent, parents. From that time on, Severine came to Monique's room as often as she could without waking her parents or Monique's mother. Marcel could never know. When the girls were together, they played dress up and had midnight tea parties. They laughed and giggled and told each other their dreams. Monique collected things from the outside world for Severine to see, to feel, and touch. What did you bring me tonight? Severine asked softly one night. Monique reached into a small cloth bag and sprinkled rich black earth into Severine's hands. This smells like the air outside, Monique told her. Then she handed Severine a bright flower from her garden. This will be your sunshine. And now close your eyes. Monique slowly opened her cup hands. Look, it was a glorious butterfly. A papillon, Severine whispered in wonder. Monique put the butterfly into Severine's cheek, near Severine's cheek. Let its wings flutter, Monique whispered. Severine caught her breath and smiled, like the kiss of an angel, Monique said softly. So here's our butterfly coming back up again, kind of giving Severine some comfort. Tears began to fill Severine's eyes and roll down her cheeks. I miss my home, Monique, my own bed, my own kitty, my garden. The Nazis won't be here forever. My mom says they will lose this war, Monique reassured her. At our home, Severine went on, we celebrated Shabbat, the holidays, Passover, Hanukkah. My mother cooked for days. Family came from everywhere. Then it all changed. We had to leave. My parents were afraid that the Nazis would kill us. You'll be home someday. You'll see. Papa is so sick from breathing damp air. He hasn't seen sunlight for months. My mom had to cover his mouth with a pillow so that his coughing couldn't be heard upstairs. I promise, Severine, someday you'll be as free as that papillon. Let it fly now, Monique, Severine said. When it flies, it will be as if Papa, my mom, and I are flying away. The girls took their butterfly to the open, wind open bedroom window and threw it into the night air and stood and watched it until they couldn't see it any more. So now we know a little bit more about what exactly the butterfly or the papillon seems to represent, seems to represent freedom, because I promise someday you'll be as free as the papillon. And when it flies, it will be as Papa, my mom and I are flying away, they have their freedom. And also think about that image of the soldier squeezing the butterfly. The butterfly is not able to fly free if it's like that. So that's something I would definitely jot down, jot down on my post-it note or in my reader's notebook. All of a the sudden, they looked up. For what reason, who knew? They saw Monsieur Lajermy, the man next door, looking right at them from his window across the courtyard. 
Monique's heart leapt in her chest. Severine slid down under the window sill so that Monsieur Ledremy couldn't see her. The girls looked at each other in sheer terror. They knew they had to tell Marcel. They ran into her room and awoke her. She was startled to see the two of them together. When she told them about their secret meetings and Monsieur Ledremy, Marcel sank to her knees in front of them. Mon Dieu, mon Dieu, they said mournfully as she rocked them in with fear. Are you angry, Madame, Madame Soilage? Severine asked as she began to cry. Think of what danger both families could possibly be in if this neighbor ends up telling people and then the Nazis hear about it. It could be very dangerous for Monique and Severine's families. Oh no, ma petite, no, of course I am not angry. You are a little girl. You didn't ask for this war or to be kept in my cellar. You needed to play. Children need other children. Marcel smoothed her hair, but you are no longer safe here, my dear. We must leave home tonight. Marcel began to pull on her clothes. We need to get you and your family out of the country. Let me see. Pere Voliard will take your parents to the next refuge, to the next refuge or the next family that's going to help keep them safe. You will travel with Monique and me. Yes, hurry, petites. Put on as many clothes as you can. Dress in layers. We can't carry valises or we will attract attention. The girls watched as Marcel Pere Voliard and Severine's parents dug holes in the cellar floor and buried everything that would look like someone had lived there. Then it was time for them to leave. Her parents came out dressed as a nun and a priest to keep disguised so that there was really no suspicion about them being moved to another place. They both cried as they held Severine and said their goodbyes. They would next meet in a village in southern France near the Swiss border. God be with us this night, Pere Voliard prayed. Adonai, yayai, etonu, halila. Severine's, Severine's father prayed as he cried. God will be with us tonight. It seemed that Monique, Severine, and Marcel had walked for miles in darkness through back alleys avoiding street lamps, taking great care to be as quiet as they could possibly be. When the first light of dawn, when the first light of dawn they reached they had reached the countryside, they stopped to rest under a grove of trees close to their rendezvous with the people who would take Severine to her parents. That's pretty scary, these, having these close interactions with the Nazis when they're trying to really escape them. Marcel had just given the girls some bread and cheese when they when she pulled them into a ditch. She motioned for them to be still and quiet. A patrol car full of Nazi soldiers slowly drove on the country road. After the car passed, the three sat without speaking. Finally, another car Driving slow, came driving slowly down the road. It stopped by the bridge a few hundred feet away and turned its headlights on and off three times. It's time, my precious child, Marcel whispered as she pushed Severine out of the ditch and they ran toward the car. These people will help you and your mama and papa. As at the car, Moni took something from the pouch she'd been carrying. It was Minwaf. Take her, Severine, Moni whispered. Tears welled up in Severine's eyes. She pulled Minois into her sweater and then reached into her pocket and pulled out a fine gold chain on which hung a gold star of David. Remember me, Monique. And for those of you who are not familiar with the star of David, it is a symbol of the Jewish faith. We are practically home, my little one, Marcel said as she and Monique arrived at the train station in Milan. This was where they were board the train to go back to Choisy Leroy. But there was an unusual amount of travelers for that early time of day. The station was crowded. Nazi soldiers were everywhere, stopping people, searching them, and barking orders. Marcel took her daughter's hand, and the other, Monique, clutched the chain. As Monique and Marcel drew closer and closer to the gate where their papers would be checked, Marcel pulled a bundle of tickets and documents from her handbag. 
the entire station of people had to squeeze through a tiny gate to board the train. Suddenly, the crowd behind Monique and her mother surged and pushed so hard, Monique lost Marcel's hand. Monique couldn't see her mother anymore. People pushed and shoved, and Monique lost her footing and fell. When she did, Severine's necklace slipped out of her hand onto the platform floor. So a pretty dangerous situation she's in now. She's lost her mother's hand. Quickly, she put it into her pocket, pulled herself to her feet, and slipped into the line that was pushing through the checkpoint and was swept with them into a shabby coach car. The tall boots were shouting at everyone. What if they searched her and found the necklace? Well, and where was her mamam? Imagine what would have happened if they had searched Monique and found the Star of David. They might have thought she was Jewish and then they would have really taken her away from her mother. Very scary for a child, for it to be happening to a child. She could see through the window of the train car people standing on the platform waiting to catch a train going in the opposite direction. Had her mother been pushed to that line instead of onto this train? She tried to see through her own tears to find her mother's face when, when she saw a girl alone. She looked thin and sad, very sad, like Severine. On the girl's yellow coat was the star of David. Was it Severine? No, she could see it now. It wasn't Severine, but it could have been. Monique held Severine's necklace tight in her pocket. Oh, my mom, my mom, where are you? She cried as the train lurched away. The train rolled to a noisy stop, St. George's, the sign read, only two kilometers from Choisy Le Leroy. From home, Monique walked through alleys and back streets that only hours before she, Severine, and my mom had passed. Oh, my mom, she cried as she walked. When Monique finally saw the familiar threshold of her front door, she pushed it open and climbed the stairs. She could still smell her mother's scent in the air. She was tired, so tired. She threw herself across her bed and fell into a deep sleep. Then she dreamed of her mother's voice, ma chérie, ma petite, the, that voice said. She dreamt a cool hand crossed her brow. It seemed so real. When she opened her eyes, she saw that the hand was real. The voice was real. It was her mamma. Oh, my sweet, brave little girl, her mother cried as they rocked in each other's arms. I just knew I would find you here. One week passed, too. Monique tried to imagine that Severine and her mama and papa, and of course, Minoif, Pinoif, were safe. Then the tall boots would march by her front gate, reminding her how hopeless it seemed. If only she had a message from Severine, a sign, something. Then one day, Monique and Marcel were planting next year's bulbs in the garden, when Marcel suddenly gasped, Regarde, Monique, look! Her mother pointed at the bleak sky above them. A butterfly fluttered down into the garden, and another, and another. They both watched as the butterfly started to land on the dry stalks of the faded flowers. First there were three, then ten, then twenty and thirty. Neighbors came out of their cottages and peered over the wall in wonder. It's a sign, my mom, a miracle, Severine sent them. I know it. She and her parents are safe. Monique held up her hand and a butterfly fluttered and landed on her finger. She took it to her cheek. Its wings fluttered. A kiss, Monique said softly. So it seems like Monique got the sign from Severine and her family that they were safe through this butterfly. Remember earlier we had talked about how they said the butterfly is representing the freedom, right? And so now it seems as though all these butterflies are, are happening, are coming up right in their garden. So it's telling me that that's a sign that Severine and her family, they're safe during this really hard time. And it, they wouldn't be safe unless it wasn't for Marcel and Monique. So I'm going to read the author's note to give us just a little bit more information about the butterfly and the characters in this book. Marcel Soliage 
was part of the French underground and resistance organized by General Charles de Gaulle. Marcel and other selfless citizens of France made their own homes a safe haven for Jews escaping to freedom, like the butterfly, during the terrible Nazi occupation. They did this at great peril to their own lives as well as the lives of their family, that these people were risking their lives, their families' lives to help the Jews escape the Nazis. According to my aunt Monique, her mother Marcel was part of the underground and resistance from the very beginning of the Nazi occupation of France. Monique was totally unaware until she met Severine, but now, but even then was not aware of the extent her mother's involvement until the end of the war. Within two years of the liberation or freedom of France, Monique and Marcel received a letter. In it was a card and a drawing of a papillon or a butterfly inscribed on the cover. Inside it says, Je vis, I live, Severine. Next to her signature was a paw print of Pinot of their cat. It was learned later that neither parent survived their attempt to escape. Severine was delivered to Switzerland, a free country at the time, and eventually made it to England, where they remained with close friends of the family for the duration of the war. Sometime later, she relocated to the new state of Israel with relatives, and Israel is known for being the home of the Jewish people. So she was really back home with her people, with her culture. Monique and Severine are friends to this day. 30 years after the end of the war, Marcel contacted local Jewish agencies and asked them to unearth possessions that were buried in her basement by families that never returned to reclaim them. So now we know that Patricia Polacco's aunt is Monique and her great aunt is Marcel. So again, a true story here of true characters and what they had done to help all these people who are in need by risking their own lives. That really tells you about the character and the determination that Marcel and her family had. So this was the first book to kind of give you a little bit more background information about the Holocaust and the time period for Number of the Stars. I'm going to be reading you another book tomorrow that's going to give you even more background information you need. See you tomorrow, everyone. Bye.